Um, but we have an exciting end of 2020 um, presentation for you. Um, and I'm thrilled to um, introduce um, uh, Shelly Ann Fluker and Leslie Miller. Dr. Fluker is an associate professor in general internal medicine. She um, did her residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital before joining faculty here in 2006. In addition to a busy primary care practice, um, she is the associate medical director at the Grady Liver Clinic, which you're gonna hear a lot more about today. Dr. Leslie Miller is a professor of medicine, also in general internal medicine. She completed her training here at Emory and joined faculty in 2001. Um, and she, um, it, her uh, career is focused around primary care-based HCV screening and treatment. She is the medical director of the Grady Liver Clinic. The Grady Liver Clinic is actually a jewel for us um, and, uh, and, and I think a really, really um, special um, program. In 2019, last year, it was recognized by the American College of Physicians with the Richard and Hilda Rosenthal Award which is, um, which is from the Rosenthal Family Foundation and recognizes the individual or organization whose recent original approach in the delivery of healthcare increases clinical and economic effectiveness. And so this was a national award and uh, we were all really, really proud to see this outstanding clinic recognized in this way. Hepatitis C has been uh, um, perhaps until COVID, uh, um, one of the you know, most studied and uh, uh, viruses with um, an incredibly fast um, uh, pace of discovery and treatment and now cure, um, which is tremendously exciting. And it is hard, I think, to stay up to speed because of that pace. So I'm really thrilled that Drs. Fluker and Miller will tell us today about what's new in 2020 with respect to Hep C. And so thank you guys both so much for joining us. Thanks, Wendy, for that really kind introduction. Um, we're super excited to share what's new in 2020. So, um, you know, obviously a lot of us have been focused on COVID this year, but we do have a lot of really neat and exciting developments in hepatitis C in 2020. So we wanna share those with you today. And our format is gonna be the format of an update. So basically we're going to have a case presentation followed by a case question. We're gonna dive into the literature to answer that question and we'll be hitting multiple topics. So fasten your seatbelt. So I'll be starting us off and then Dr. Fluker will be taking over. Um, I just wanna pause for a moment here to let you all see our disclosures. And here are our learning objectives over the next hour. Um, you should be able to list the newest recommendations for screening and treatment for hepatitis C virus infection and I'll use hep C and HCV interchangeably throughout. Um, you should be able to describe the management of HCV in special populations, including people who inject drugs. And finally, describe the latest strategies in caring for patients with complications of HCV, including cirrhosis and liver cancer. So I'm gonna start us off talking about HCV screening, and this is an area of a lot of new news in 2020. So we'll start with a case, um, UC Anne, for a new patient virtual primary care visit. She's 37 years old and has a history of hypertension. Uh, and with only one problem to address, when does that ever happen, that somebody just has hypertension, um, your visit is surprisingly quick and you have time to address all of her health maintenance topics. So you start by checking her care gaps in an electronic health record. Um, and since she's not a baby boomer, your EHR doesn't flag Anne for screening. She's younger than the baby boomer age cohort at 37. You vaguely remember something you heard on the news pre-COVID about universal HCV screening, but that time's a blur, so you're not really sure. Our case question is, does Anne need HCV screening? A, no, she's not a baby boomer, so she doesn't need it, or B, yes, all adults 18 to 79 need HCV screening. So let's jump into the literature to answer this question. The question is, what are the new guidelines for HCV screening by the US Preventative Services Task Force and the CDC? So this was published in JAMA in March of this year. So this is the USPSTF recommendation statement for screening for hepatitis C virus infection in adolescents and adults. And just to cut to the chase, you can see the summary recommendation. The USPSTF recommends screening for hepatitis C in all adults age 18 to 79 years. And they gave this a grade B recommendation, which means we should do it. So um, why the update? And this is an update from the USPSTF 2013 recommendation that was just to screen baby boomers and those with risk factors. So there's been a lot of changes since then. Um, and I'm gonna kind of dive into each of these bullets a little bit more deeply, but just as an overview, um, HCV is the most common bloodborne infection in the United States. Um, and when I first started talking about hep C, I've been doing this since 2004, the talk was always, you know, prevalence is down, incidence is down, and that's all changed now. 
Um, acute cases have increased fourfold over the last decade, and that's due to the opioid epidemic and the increase in injection drug use. HCV is deadly, and we'll see how deadly in just a second. Um, but the silver lining to this is that it's very easily cured, um, as Dr. Armstrong mentioned, with safe and effective oral medication. So kind of putting all of these things together, that hepatitis C is common, it's deadly, and it's curable, it makes it really compelling to pay attention to. And because of this, the World Health Organization, because of this sort of triad of common, deadly, curable, um, the World Health Organization now calls for a hepatitis C elimination by 2030. So we should be able to you know, eliminate across the globe um, because we have this, you know, we have screening tests, we have great treatment. Um, but as you'll see, we're not quite there in terms of getting to this goal. Um, so just to go deeper into each of these, um, you can see that the opioid epidemic is fueling the rise in HCV cases. So you can see here that from 2010 to 2014, new hep C cases in the U.S. increased by 250 percent, and this trend has only continued since then. Um, this is depicting how deadly hepatitis C is. So this is data out of the CDC showing um, deaths from hepatitis C in the red line versus deaths from all the other nationally notifiable infectious conditions combined. So this includes HIV, TB, hepatitis B, and the next 57 other diseases down the list that are reportable. So in 2011, hepatitis C deaths surpassed those from all of those conditions combined. So a leading killer. Um, and again, silver lining here. So treatments have gotten so much better over the years. So when I started doing hep C treatment in 2004, we were in the heart of inter the interferon era. We, um, you know, not that many people were candidates for treatment and we didn't cure that many of them because the effectiveness just wasn't that great. But fast forward to 2020, we have new direct acting antiviral regimen. So they're all oral, very effective cure rates across or greater than 95% and really easy to tolerate. Um, so we kind of have all the tools we need in our toolbox to be able to eliminate, but look at this showing the progress or rather lack of progress towards our HCV elimination goals. So you can see I circled 2030 down there at the bottom. That's when we're supposed to eliminate and only the top seven countries in green are on track to eliminate by 2030. Um, you can see most of this graph is red. We're at the bottom, although it's it's alphabetical <laughs> order. So um, there's a bunch of countries in red, and um, it looks like we will not eliminate until 2050. Um, but we have the capability to. And the reason I'm stressing this is that screening is a really um, important component of being able to reach our elimination goals. We can't get folks into treatment and cured if we don't know they have the disease. So that's why um, screening is so important and why these recommendations came out. So back to the USPSTF recommendation, um, this is an update from 2013. The population that they looked at were asymptomatic adults aged 18 to 79 without known liver disease. And their evidence assessment was that with moderate certainty that screening for hepatitis C in this age group had substantial benefit and that led to the grade B recommendation. Um, quickly after this, in April of this year, um, the CDC came out with their universal screening recommendations. Um, and just the timing I want to highlight here. So obviously March and April, this was, you know, when COVID was just hitting. So I think during a normal year, this would have gotten a lot more attention, but obviously, you know, there were competing priorities this year, understandably. Um, so folks may have missed that this recommendation came out. Um, so the CDC recommendations are largely similar to the USPSTF. I just want to highlight some differences. Um, the CDC recommends screening once for all adults ages 18 and up. So they actually don't put that upper um, age cap of 79 years. Um, and they also put kind of a lower limit of HCV RNA positivity or prevalence so that if you're screening in a population and you find that your RNA prevalence is less than 0.1%, that's substantially low enough that you can stop screening. Um, the other key aspect I want to highlight about the CDC recommendations is that they stress screening all pregnant women during each pregnancy um, with the same prevalence caveats for RNA as above. And this is really important because this is a group um, that hadn't been targeted for screening before, and we'll look at why this is an important group to screen in a second. Um, and then I just want to also emphasize that risk factor-based screening is still a part of this. So you can see the risk factors listed below. Um, and anybody who falls outside this age group but has a risk factor obviously should be screened as well. But when you think about it, if you're covering all adults 18 and up or 18 to 79, you're pretty much going to hit 
all of those risk factors without even having to ask for them. And that's the beauty of this universal screening is that you don't have to get into a conversa conversation about risk factors, you're just covering everybody and the hope is we'll get many more people diagnosed and into care. So this is just to highlight why screening in pregnant women is so important. So this is a graph from HEPView and you can see that they highlighted five states in the US um, and the green bars are the hepatitis C RNA positivity among all adults and the orange bars show the positivity among pregnant women. So you can see it in four out of these five states, actually the prevalence in pregnant women was way higher than the general population. And this is again driven by the opioid epidemic, lots of um, cases of hepatitis C in young women of childbearing age. So this is why screening in pregnant women is really important. And we've just implemented this at Grady based on the new CDC recommendations. So back to our case question, does Anne need HCV screening? Um, a, no, she's not a baby boomer, wrong answer. Um, or B, the right answer is yes, all adults ages 18 to 79 need screening. Um, and the bottom line is to screen all adults 18 and up for hepatitis C. And you wanna consider that upper limit of 79 that the USPSTF recommends if there's a concern for reimbursement because CMS payments are tied to that USPSTF recommendation, not necessarily the CDC. Um, screening includes all pregnant women. We should continue to screen those with risk factors who fall outside the age range, but again, most people will fall within the age range. Um, and screening is key to elimination success, and that's why it's so important. Um, I do want to highlight, though, that we know from lots of studies looking at the uptake of baby boomer screening, which was the last recommendation, um, it's not all that great. So the rationale is there. The tools are there, but obviously patients have competing priorities, providers have competing priorities, and um, their financial considerations, and so it just hasn't gotten done to the extent that we had hoped. Um, so we want to think about what are some strategies to improve screening, and they include getting institutional buy-in. It's been great to work at Grady on this because we had that. Um, electronic health record prompts are really helpful, sort of taking the decision making out of it on the provider side, but just getting a little nudge to do this. Um, getting reflex RNA testing is really important. So the hepatitis C testing is a two-part test. You need the antibody to show exposure. And then if somebody's antibody positive, you wanna check for the HCV RNA to confirm viremia or chronic infection. So coupling these two pieces makes the whole process much smoother and increases the throughput. So we were able to implement this at Grady back in 2017. So any positive antibody automatically in the labs lab gets reflexed to an RNA test. Um, linkage to care options and having a patient navigator to help get a patient to that linkage to care visit is really helpful. Um, and finally, you know, having financial coverage for testing and treatment is important. So I just want to take this a little bit closer to home now and talk about how we've been able to implement routine screening at Grady Health System. Um, so we started this back in 2012 with the baby boomer screening recommendations and we've constantly expanded and updated um, and we've recently updated to accommodate the universal screening recommendations. So we basically use um, logic in our electronic health record, which is EPIC, to identify any patients in the appropriate age range. So now it's 18 to 79 that don't have a prior HCV diagnosis or a prior HCV test. And the beauty of the HCV screening is that it's a one-time test for the vast majority of people. So if they've already done it, even if it was 10 years ago, um, they're done. So it's really easy to kind of check that box for, for folks as they come in. Um, so if they meet the logic, then in the triage process, um, a flag will show up for the triage provider who's a nurse or a CMA saying this patient's due for a hepatitis C test. And then they use opt out language to make that test offer and then place the order. So this is just a sample of what our prompts look like. So once that um, the triage provider places the order, this BPA shows up for the provider to sign the one on the top. Um, and I just want to point out that the order is linked to the antibody with reflex test. So we were able to update this in 2017 um, from just the plain antibody test to the reflex test um, once we had that available. And then I want to highlight too, the bottom picture is our inpatient order set. So we were able again in 2017 to incorporate routine hepatitis C screening on the inpatient side, which isn't widely done, but it's been super high yield. Our inpatient prevalence is about 14% of antibody positivity. Um, and you can see it's just pre-checked there. And if the patient declines, you can just uncheck that box. But that's been really helpful in terms of increasing screening. And just to show you sort of how this has evolved over the years and what our footprint is. So we started in 2012 in the primary care center at Grady. 
Um, we um, had CDC funding to do that. And then um, in 2015, we expanded to the neighborhood health centers. Um, and then in 2017 to all of ambulatory and also the inpatient side. And then our most recent partners have been the walk-in clinic and the emergency department. So we've kind of expanded year after year um, and had really high yield with this screening. So this just shows our screening outcomes. This is just 2015 to 2020 data. Um, so we've tested over 45,000 people and close to 4,000 are antibody positive, which is a whopping 8.5% prevalence. Um, just to give you sort of some perspective on that, the prevalence of hepatitis C in general in the United States is 1%. Um, we, were man we managed to test almost 90% for HCV RNA. And keep in mind that part of this time period, we weren't doing reflex testing. So this took a lot of um, work on our navigator side, but we're really proud of these results. Um, a little over half were viremic or chronically infected, and then we were able to link close to 70% to care and having the Grady Liver Clinic as a linkage option really helped with that um, linkage number. Um, so the whole point of screening is that to identify patients who have the disease and um, really to get them into treatment and get them cured. So I'm gonna switch gears here from screening and talk about simplified HCV treatment, which is another new thing in 2020. So for our case, um, you're staffing liver clinic during the COVID-19 global pandemic and the clinic has just reopened after lockdown. So you see Willie, who's a 67 year old man who was recently diagnosed with HCV during a hospital stay. This is a common thing we see in liver clinic now that we're screening inpatient. His fiber scan, which is a non-invasive fibrosis measurement tool shows F2 or moderate liver fibrosis. And he's eager for hepatitis C treatment. Um, due to a national supply shortage due to COVID, HCV genotype testing isn't currently available. And due to the pandemic, Willie is not keen on coming back to the clinic multiple times over the next several months for on-treatment visits. So the question is, he asked you know, whether he can do his hep C treatment via telehealth. Um, so our case question is, can he safely and effectively be treated for hep C via telehealth? No, current guidelines recommend lab and clinical monitoring during treatment, or yes, current guidelines support a simplified treatment strategy with limited on-treatment monitoring. So our question is, what are the new guidelines for simplified HCV treatment? And we will jump into the literature to figure this out. So this is an article that was published um, about a year ago, October of 2019, and this looked at simplified monitoring for hepatitis C virus treatment with Glecaprevir plus Pibrentosphere, a randomized non-inferiority trial. And this was published in the Journal of Hepatology. Um, so basically what they did is an open label multi-center phase 3B trial in Europe, the US and Australia. And they took treatment naive patients who are non-serotic. They excluded folks who are injecting drugs. Um, all received Glepib for eight weeks and the patients were randomized to either a simplified or standard treatment. And I'll show you what that looks like. So they um, enrolled 380 patients and they randomized them two to one into simplified monitoring or standard. So we're gonna look at the bottom line first, which is the standard monitoring. And basically um, each of those capsule icons represents four weeks of treatment. So patients in the standard monitoring were seen at baseline, they were given their first four weeks of medication at week four of treatment, they received their second month of medication. They had a phone visit and they had an in-person visit with labs, physical exam, all of that. And they had the same at week eight when they completed treatment. Um, then they were followed for 12 weeks post-treatment for their SBR12. That stands for sustained virologic response at 12 weeks. And that's what we equate to cure for hepatitis C. So contrast that with the simplified monitoring arm above. So they got their whole eight weeks of treatment up front. Just here you go, take it, you know, take your three pills a day for the next eight weeks. And they just had phone visits at week four and week eight, but no in-person labs or exam. And they were also followed up to SBR12. So the results of this study for their intention to treat analysis showed that 92% of patients on the simplified treatment were cured and 95% on the standard. And actually this didn't meet their non-inferiority goal. However, when they looked at the modified intention to treat analysis, so anybody who got a dose of medication and actually showed up to get their SVR12 lab done, the results were much better. So 97% simplified and 98% standard. And same with the PER protocol, where they looked at patients who got a dose of medication, finished their treatment course, and got their SVR12 labs done. 
Um, the authors noted that the safety and adherence were equivalent in these two arms, um, but again, it didn't reach non-inferiority. And they conclude that this wasn't really due to virologic failure, as you can see from the modified and for protocol analysis, but really just to patients who were lost to follow up. So we didn't have their SVR12 data. And the conclusion was this could be an effective and safe strategy in selected patients. So right around the same time the study came out, the ASLD, which is the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease and the Infectious Disease Society of America, who kind of put out our national hep C treatment guidelines, um, actually came out with these simplified treatment guidelines. So these became the national standard. Um, so this was really exciting to give us an option for, you know, especially in places that are resource limited, um, you know, to really make this process a lot simpler for providers and patients to get more folks on treatment. So this is an example of the simplified treatment guideline for patients without cirrhosis, although there is one for patients with cirrhosis as well. So anyone eligible for treatment or folks who don't have cirrhosis and haven't been previously treated for hepatitis C, and then you can see on the right the exclusion criteria. So anyone who's HIV co-infected or hepatitis B co-infected, anyone who's pregnant has hepatocellular carcinoma or prior liver transplant is not a candidate either. Um, but if you don't meet those criteria and you are a candidate, basically it's really simple and straightforward. So you just determine a patient's fibrosis level by FIB4. So FIB4, for those who aren't familiar, stands for fibrosis 4, and it's a really simple calculation you can do based on patients' labs that you already have. So it includes AST, ALT, platelet count, and then the patient's age. And you put that into a calculator and it spits out a number and 3.25 is the kind of magic number cut off for FIB4. Anything less than 3.25 is considered non-serotic. So by these simplified guidelines, you don't need imaging, you don't need a fibro scan, you don't need any fancy proprietary tests. You can just do a FIB4. If they're non-serotic, go ahead with these non-serotic guidelines. And all they need are the labs that you see here. So CBC, hepatic function, GFR, you need an HCV RNA, an HIV test, PEP-B surface antigen and HCG. Um, all those within six months of starting treatment, you need to do med reconciliation for drug-drug interactions because there are several with our direct acting antivirals. And then you treat with a pangenotypic hepatitis C regimen and we'll see what those look like in a second. I think the most important thing other than the simplified workup is the lack of requirement for in-person labs or visits except for patients on warfarin is the only exception they have. Um, so this can all be done over the phone remotely, which is really perfect timing when COVID hit and we had to go to virtual visits. We said, hey, this is, you know, really nice timing that we can use these simplified guidelines for backup. Um, so these are the five medications we use kind of day in, day out for hepatitis C. And I highlighted in the box in red at the bottom, all of the pangenotypic regimens. But the two that are highlighted in yellow, so the soft filpatosphere and the glee pib, are um, the ones recommended by the simplified treatment guidelines. So the soft bell box, which is the one not highlighted, um, that's kind of our biggest gun and we say that for folks who failed prior DAA regimens. Um, so I just wanna again, bring it close to home and talk about how we've been able to incorporate the simplified treatment at the Grady Liver Clinic. Um, so we already heard um, what the liver clinic does. We're a primary care-based generalist run hepatitis C clinic at Grady Health System. We provide critical access to care and treatment for un and underinsured patients with hepatitis C. Um, we serve as a linkage venue for all of those screening programs I talked about. And then we also, um, this is one of the best parts of Liver Clinic, we have lots of learners rotating through. And so we really are able to expose folks to um, hepatitis C treatment and hopefully they're inspired to do that um, after they finish training. Um, so this is just some of our services. We do a lot of counseling and education. We vaccinate for hepatitis A and B. We do fibrosis staging. Um, so we actually have a fibro scan that we use. We do cirrhosis management for our hep C positive folks. And then all of this kind of really culminates in getting people treated and cured. We're really focused on micro elimination of hep C at Grady. Um, and this is how we do it. So I just wanna show you sort of how our treatment program looked pre-COVID and then how we've been able to use the simplified guidelines to um, really respond and be able to continue treatment even in the setting of the pandemic. So we used to see folks every four weeks. So we had an office visit, um, had them do labs, and then we gave them their medication at the visit. At the end of treatment, they had a phone visit and then a phone reminder to come in for the labs at their SVR12 time point. 
Um, and then fast forward to COVID, we were able to incorporate the simplified treatment guidelines. And then we, we could do this 100% by telehealth. Um, we ideally like to have one visit for treatment start in person, but that's optional. Um, if we don't have the patient come in person, we can courier the medication to them. And then at week four, it's all telehealth. So they get a check-in visit on the phone from the clinical pharmacist. We courier the medication to their home. And then we check in by phone at the end of treatment, week eight, and then um, the same. So 12 weeks after we have a lab follow-up and check in by phone as well. Um, so back to our case question, can Willie safely and effectively be treated for HCV via telehealth? Yes, current guidelines do support a simplified treatment strategy with limited on treatment monitoring. So the bottom line here is that current national guidelines do support simplified treatment for selected patients. This has been a really important strategy during COVID. Um, it allows for fewer touch points with patients and high patient satisfaction. Um, we do have data from, um, we don't have SBR data yet, but we have data on folks who've been able to be retained in treatment. And that looks just as good as it did for our more hands-on treatment approach pre-COVID. Um, so we're really anxious to see real world data, both from our clinic and others about incorporation of these simplified guidelines. Um, so I'm gonna stop here and turn it over to Dr. Fluker, um, who will continue the presentation. Oh, you're on mute. Got it. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so uh, again, thank you for having us. Um, as you can tell, uh, this is a labor of love for us. And so uh, not only do we enjoy this work, but we enjoy teaching and sharing um, with others. So I'm going to switch gears and um, talk about some special populations and talk about complications related to hepatitis C. So first I'm gonna start off talking about HCV and persons who inject drugs. And my case is based on a patient actually that I saw in the hospital um, earlier this year. Uh, she's a 26 year old female who comes in to establish primary care. She has ankylosing spondylitis treated with opiates which led to um, injection drug use and she has hepatitis C. She was hospitalized for MRSA bacteremia and that was complicated by osteomyelitis. Um, during the hospitalization, she expressed a desire for treatment for her opioid use disorder, and she was actually started on buprenorphine naloxone. And then because of her history of IV drug use, the team felt that the safest discharge was to a rehabilitation facility to complete her IV antibiotic course. She did that, was discharged from rehab two weeks ago, and now she comes in requesting treatment for HCV. She is still abstinent from her IV drug use, and she's still taking her buprenorphine naloxone, and at this point, it's been about three months. So I'm, if I were to ask you all what you would do in this case, I think there's probably three answers that I would get. I think some people would say, let's wait until she's been abstinent from her IV drug use for six months before referring her for HCV treatment. I think others might say, you know what, I think we should wait until she has come off her buprenorphine naloxone um, and has remained abstinent. We know for sure she's quit before referring her for HCV treatment. And then um, some of us, you probably know which of us would say refer now for HCV treatment. So um, this is a really important topic for us to discuss because as Dr. Miller already mentioned, um, IV drug use is the most common risk factor for HCV in the US. And in the context of the opioid epidemic, the majority of new HCV cases, 70% uh, are in persons who inject drugs. And I'm sure uh, many of you saw some of the stories that came out earlier in the pandemic about rising um, opioid overdoses during the COVID-19 pandemic, which might even indicate rising opioid use disorder. And so we might see that this is increasing even more um, when we see sort of what the fallout is from um, the pandemic as relates to HCV. And there are a lot of challenges in taking care of um, persons who inject drugs. Um, one big one is a patient provider relationship. Uh, unfortunately, this patient population has often been marginalized by the medical community. And so they have a lot of distrust um, of the medical community. In addition, uh, there's a lot of bias on the part of providers towards these patients. Uh, these patients also 
tend to be impacted more by social determinants of health, such as homelessness and poverty. Um, they have um, many comorbid conditions. They'll have um, other substance use disorders and mental health comorbid conditions in addition to chronic medical conditions. And then there are lots of concerns that we hear about treatment adherence. Is this somebody who's gonna take all their medications? Drug-drug interactions come up a lot. What if they're taking opioid agonist therapy? Will that interact with the HCV medicine? And then probably the biggest concern that a lot of people have is the risk of reinfection. If I um, get somebody treated and cured for their hepatitis C and they're actively using IV drugs, are they just gonna get reinfected? And you know, what's the point? And so I think the question here really is, is a hep C treatment efficacious in persons who inject drugs? And there are actually several studies that answer this question. I'm just going to go over two. Um, one I'll go over briefly, and this is um, a pharma-sponsored um, open-label single-arm phase four trial that looked at sofosbuvir velpatosphere in people who recently injected and so these were um, persons who had been injecting within the past six months, some of whom were actively injecting um, at the time of the study. Uh, they enrolled 103 patients. Um, some of these patients were also on opioid agonist therapy, and they gave them one week electronic blister packs of their medication. So they were able to actually very accurately track treatment adherence. Um, and what they found is that of their 103 patients, they had 97% who completed treatment. Um, the three people who did not complete treatment, one person unfortunately died of an overdose and two were lost to follow up. 94% um, um, achieved SVR12. And again, that was primarily uh, due to some people being lost to follow up and not being able to complete their SVR12s. And they only had one reinfection. There were no significant adverse events that were attributable to drug therapy. So this study really showed that you could have um, high um, treatment completion among persons who were actively um, injecting drugs with high SVR rates, um, low adverse events, and very low risk of reinfection. Um, I know many of you are saying, okay, but that was a drug that was a drug trial, right? So that's like nirvana, that's not real life. And I agree, that's not my real life either. But luckily we have a study that does talk about our real life. And this came out just this year in February of 2020. Um, and it was published online in Clinical Infectious Disease. And they looked at the impact of concurrent initiation of opioid agonist therapy on HCV treatment and drug use outcomes. And this was at a harm reduction center in Washington, DC. Um, so real world study. They use a prospective open label observational trial design, and they enrolled 100 patients with HCV infection who had opioid use disorder and ongoing injection drug use. Um, some of these patients at the time of enrollment were on opioid agonist therapy. Um, they, they were treated with sofosbuvir velpatosphere, and anyone who's not, who was not already on opioid agonist therapy was offered buprenorphine initiation. Their primary endpoint was looking at SVR12, which, is, which again, that's our, our um, measure of cure, meaning no HCV RNA detectable 12 weeks after completion of treatment. And they also, for their secondary endpoints, looked at uptake and retention of opioid agonist therapy, change in risk behavior, and they looked at determinants of SVR. So what they found was that um, they had an 82% um, uh, SVR rate. And importantly, this was not associated with baseline opioid agonist status. It was not associated with on-treatment drug use, and it was not associated with imperfect daily adherence. In fact, it was associated with completing two or more months of HCV treatment. This is a 12 week or three week, 12 week or three month course of treatment and receiving opioid agonist therapy. So some of you might look at this 82% SVR and think, well, that's kind of low because you know, we've been talking about 90 something percent SVR up until this point, but that was, really, um, that was really lowered by the fact that there were people who didn't complete their treatment and didn't take at least two months of treatment. And the SVR rates were pretty high for people who 
um, completed two months of treatment. And again, receiving opioid agonist therapy was also positively associated with SVR. Looking at their secondary outcomes, um, at week 24, they still had 68% of patients who were receiving opioid agonist therapy. Um, and that was an, incre an increase compared to those who entered um, receiving opioid agonist therapy. Uh, there were fewer opioid positive urine drug screens in this group, lower HIV risk taking behavior scores and lower rates of opioid overdose, which is what we would expect. We know that these are positive outcomes of opioid agonist therapy and this trial confirmed that. So this really gives us our answer to our patient's case is that we should absolutely refer her for HCV treatment now. And I just can't say enough about how critical it is that we are treating persons who inject drugs. Because so many of these persons are the ones with new HCV infection, we will never eliminate HCV in the United States if we're not treating patients who inject drugs. And again, the data supports that this is effective and it's a low, uh, there are low rates of reinfection. And this is really a prime opportunity to engage these persons in treatment for their opioid use disorder. And uh, you can successfully, as this last study um, showed, engage patients in opioid agonist therapy, and that actually leads to higher rates of SVR12 while decreasing their risk of ongoing drug use and the complications uh, related to that. So that's a message that I really want to leave with our group, um, that it's really important that we're supporting treatment of ACV in persons who inject drugs. All right. I'm going to switch gears now. And, you know, we find ourselves treating a lot of patients with cirrhosis um, as a result of their HCV. And so in addition to um, diet screening, diagnosing hepatitis C, um, and curing patients of their hepatitis C, we're also doing a lot of management of uh, mostly compensated cirrhotics and thinking about um, the sort of preventative measures that are uh, indicated in these patients. So I'm going to now spend the rest of the time talking about um, cirrhosis and um, three of the things that come up very frequently for us in our patients with um, HCV cirrhosis. The first one is screening for esophageal varices. So our case here is a 60-year-old male who comes in for a primary care visit and you see that he has a history of HCV cirrhosis and he was actually recently treated and cured. His platelet count uh, is the only abnormal lab. It's 180, and his nadir was 164. And so you ask if he's ever had an EPD to screen for esophageal varices, and he says, no, I haven't, but my liver doctor says I don't, I don't need one. So you're kind of scratching your head uh, on the inside. <laughs> and so you decide to head to the literature to try to answer the question, which is, do all patients with cirrhosis need an EGD to screen for esophageal varices? So this answer actually comes from a paper that was published in 2017. And I know this is an update for Hep C in 2020, but we find that a lot of people are not familiar with this guidance. And so that's why we thought it was important to cover here. So I know, I know that you all know that um, Traditionally, all patients with cirrhosis have been recommended to have an EGD to screen for esophageal varices because esophage esophageal variceal hemorrhage is one of the most deadly complications of cirrhosis. However, cirrhosis is a heterogeneous disease and there are many patients with cirrhosis who are at low risk for esophageal varices. And what studies have shown is that liver stiffness measured by transient elastography um, or a fiber scan, which we've mentioned before, can be used to determine the risk of variceal bleed. So just wanna take a moment and explain what transient elastography is, because we've mentioned it several times throughout the talk, and um, some of you may not be familiar with it. So um, the, the brand name for the machine that's most commonly used in the United States is called a fiber scan. It's pictured here. And this is an in-office test. We are lucky enough um, uh, through the efforts of Dr. Miller to have one of these in our Grady Liver Clinic. And we've all been trained to use it, although our nurse practitioner is the person who primarily does them for us. And as you can see, it has a probe that looks kind of like an ultrasound probe. And you put that on the liver and it produces a shear wave. All the patient feels is a little thump, a very light thump. And it produces a shear wave that travels through the liver and we're measuring the speed at which that shear wave travels. 
and the faster it travels, the more, um, the stiffer the liver is. So you can see on this graph that what we are trying to use the liver stiffness measurement is to approximate what the fibrosis staging would be if you had done a liver biopsy on that person. So the Medivere staging system is one of the most common um, staging systems for fibrosis on liver biopsy. And if somebody has a liver stiffness measurement that's greater than 12.5, that person likely has cirrhosis or F4 fibrosis. And then you can see that there are other cutoffs for lower stages of fibrosis. And so what the AASLD practice guidance recommends based on the literature is that if patients have a liver stiffness measurement of less than 20 and platelet counts of greater than 150, they have a less than 5% probability of high-risk varices. And so EGD can be safely avoided in these patients and it likely avoids up to 25% of EGD. And so basically you can utilize platelet count and liver stiffness scores if available and only need to refer for EGD if their platelet count is less than 150 or their liver stiffness measurement is greater than 20 in cases where you have a liver stiffness measurement available. So for that gentleman, uh, his liver stiffness measurement um, would be utilized to make that decision. Next, I wanna talk about HCV cirrhosis and HCC, which is the other complication, hepatocellular carcinoma, that we're seeing a lot of in our HCV cirrhotic. So this is the same patient. You check in with his liver doctor, you find out that his liver stiffness measurement was 18. So you confirm that he doesn't need an AG, EGD. And so then he brings up, oh, well, um, he told me that I do need to have um, screening for liver cancer for my entire life. So this is an important issue as well because HCV is the most common cause of HCC in Western countries as opposed to hepatitis C in Asia and Africa. Um, the main risk factor for HCC in HCV is advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, and the annual incidence is increased over time and is now 2 to 8%. So our question here is, do cirrhotic patients who have been cured of HCV need to have HCC screening, and how should patients be screened for HCC? Um, so just very quickly, um, I just um, I have the reference for these guidelines at the bottom of the slide but risk of HCC does decrease when you're cured of HCV. DAA therapy is associated with a 71% reduction in HCC risk, but uh, it does not go to zero. And HCC has been reported up to 10 years after SVR12. Recommended modality for screening for HCC remains ultrasound, plus or minus AFP every six months. Although I know many of you feel that CT and MRI is superior to ultrasound and probably is superior in some patients, there is not enough data to support this recommendation in the guideline. So we should continue to screen our cirrhotic patients who've been cured of HCV for HCC with ultrasound plus or minus AFP every six months, although CT or MRI may be superior in some patients, for example, patients who are I think it will be interesting to see over time if this guidance recommend, if this guidance changes as we follow more patients who have been cured of their HCC. All right, and I'm gonna just finish up in the last three minutes here talking about statins and cirrhosis. This is something else that comes up quite frequently for us in um, our clinic. So your patient has one more question, and at this point, like the visit's been going on for 30 minutes, so you're kind of annoyed, <laughs> but he has one more question. He says he's concerned about his cholesterol medication damaging his liver, and he wants to know, do you think he should keep taking it? So I think one or two answers would come up. You would say, no, you should definitely stop that statin because it increases risk of decompensation of cirrhosis. Or you say, actually, no, you should continue it because it's gonna be very beneficial to you. So this um, question comes up so often, are statins harmful or beneficial to patients with cirrhosis in general? Although here we're talking about patients with HCV. So this was actually answered initially in 2017 by a systematic review that looked at studies and over 120,000 patients with chronic liver disease. And they suggested that based on the data, statins actually decrease the risk of hepatic decompensation, decrease the risk of variceal bleeding or progression of portal hypertension, decrease risk of HCC, and may even lower mortality risk. 
very interestingly is this paper that came out in 2019 that specifically looked at lipophilic um, versus hydrophilic statins for risk of hepatular cellular carcinoma. And so this was um, a study that was um, looking at the relationship between lipophilic or hydrophilic, hydrophilic statin use and HCC incidence and mortality in a nationwide population that actually had both hepatitis B and hepatitis C. This was a Swedish patient registry from 2005 to 2013. And they did prospective propensity score match cohorts looking at over 16,000 adults about half of whom were initiating on statins, the majority of which were lipophilic statins. And they looked at time to incident HCC. And you can see here, these graphs are not subtle, that patients who were using lipophilic statins had a lower, uh, statistically significantly lower cumulative incidence of HCC, but there was really no difference for those who were using hydrophilic statins. And then, um, all-cause mortality, again, similar data where there was a statistically significant difference for lipophilic statins. So based on this and previous data, patients with compensated cirrhosis, if they have an indication for a statin, should definitely continue it. And just to remind you, the lipophilic statins are atorvastatin, lovastatin, and simvastatin, uh, and their use does seem to be associated significantly with reduced HCC incidence albeit this was a Swedish, Swedish patient registry, so we do need more data to see if this is applicable to other patient populations. And definitely more research would be needed to determine if lipophilic statin therapy should be used for preventing HCC. But for people who have statin indications, we should continue it. Uh, and it just adds more to the folklore of statin therapy. So to finish up, and then we'll be happy to answer questions, uh, HCV in 2020, we should screen all adults for HCV. We should consider HCV treatment in all patients, including persons who inject drugs. A simplified evaluation and treatment strategy can be used for many, many patients. And then when you're thinking about complications of HCV specifically related to cirrhosis, liver stiffness measurement and platelet count can be used to determine need for esophageal variceal screening, we should continue to screen all patients with HCV cirrhosis for HCC and continue those statins uh, in our patients with compensated cirrhosis. All right, we'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you guys so much. That was really fantastic. And I love the sort of case-based nature of your presentation there. Um, uh, a question in the chat that I um, totally resonate with as well. Um, you know, in HIV, uh, the HIV realm, we have moved towards trying to uh, start therapy in hospital in patients um, in hopes that that will um, lead to both faster initiation of therapy, but uh, um, longer um, retention in therapy. Is there um, been thought about in hospital initiation on HCV therapy and discharging with the uh, month supply in hand? Um, I can take that. So this would be my dream come true. I mean, I think a lot of lessons learned from HIV. Um, we've been fortunate to apply to HCV and that's been really helpful. This would be one of them. We've tried on, I mean, there's so many patients who, you know, people reach out and say this person's like sitting in the hospital getting like long-term IV antibiotics, you know, this would be the perfect time to start HCV treatment. I totally agree. It's all a matter of payers. And unfortunately, and we'll have to talk about how this works on the HIV side, there's an issue where we can't get the medications paid for while somebody's an inpatient. So that's been our big hurdle. But yes, absolutely, that would be a game changer if we could do that. Yeah, no, I think it makes sense. Um, uh, and I agree. Um, Dr. Stevens asks, any update on an HCV vaccine? And, um, and actually, I'll start there with that question first. Um, yeah, yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. So um, I've heard folks talk about it at conferences and, you know, it's, um, it always is like, you know, 15 talks about treatment and one talk about a vaccine and the interesting conversation comes up like, you know, do we actually need a vaccine for hepatitis C and there's sort of this back and forth that, you know, technically we have all the tools we need without one and we're making decent progress. However, there's also the argument that like, 
no infectious disease has ever been successfully eliminated without a vaccine. So I think it would be a really helpful um, tool in the armamentarium. Like, yes, we have great treatment, but there are lots of folks who can't access it. Um, so I think there's sort of continuing work on a vaccine in the background, but you know, a lot of stress on using the tools we have like screening and treatment. Can you comment on sort of our system-wide programs, so programs at the VA or at Emory Healthcare? Yeah. So, so our I don't know if Emily Cartwright is on the is on the, um, but that's one of our colleagues. Um, and in terms of the VA, I mean they've essentially eliminated hepatitis C at the VA. Like they um, did a big push when uh, treatments first came out. And Leslie, do you know the numbers of? There, with the percent of patients that they've cured at the VA. I think it's like close to 90, I want to yeah. say, or above 90. Yeah, exactly. And then similarly, Emily just received a FAME grant um, that Leslie is mentoring her on, where she's going to be looking at um, some of the care gaps at VHC. If Emily's here, I'd love for her to give herself a shout out, but I don't think <laughs> <it's>... <laughs> Yeah, I can't. I don't see her either. Yeah, but that Emily is actively working on a frame grant, looking at some of the gaps uh, in Hep C care um, in the Emory healthcare system. Another um, question that you know harkens to our practice in the HIV clinic as well: Are there guidelines on interval screening for people with continued risk factors rather than a just a once in lifetime screen? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because um, I was, you know, focused on the the universal and mentioned that there are very few people who need, um, you know, more than one test, but there are two distinct groups. So um, people who are actively injecting drugs should get tested yearly or even more frequently if they have a clinical indication like an elevation in ALT. And then HIV positive men who have sex with men are the other group that should be tested annually or again more frequently if needed. Yeah, no, I, I, we have seen so many um, new infections in the um, MSM group that we have learned to test anytime we test for syphilis often. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Manning is asking, is there a correlation between um, uh, injection drug use, abstinence recovery, and HCV treatment initiation? For, is there like um, evidence that um, getting HCV treatment initiation helps with yeah, there is some evidence that suggests that, um, and kind of a little bit of that was seen in the study that I mentioned, but you basically now have these patients in essentially, uh, and a lot of people are even more interested in their HCV treatment initially, and say their opioid use um, treatment, but then you get them into care, and they form collaborative relationships with their treaters, and then that's an opportunity to bring them into care for their opioid use disorder. So yeah. Sorry, I think that background noise was coming from me somehow. Um, thank you. Though uh, I really, really um, uh, found this to be an outstanding talk and an outstanding way to close out our season. I know either of you guys would be happy to field any questions or help all uh, those of us with clinical consultations, etc. If we run into challenges. Um, appreciate your passion for this topic um, and uh, uh, strive to eradicate yet another disease from the face of the earth. So thank you guys. Thanks.